Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Jeff Sakamoto. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for coming here. I have to tell you, my last name is Sakamoto. Obviously, I'm from Japan. My mom, probably can't tell by looking at me, is Swiss. My parents met in English school in the 1950s, having DNA uh, from two countries that pride themselves on making the best watches in the world. Uh, it irks me to be here late, trust me. So thank you very much for being here. I should also say that uh, today is a, um, a couple things come full circle. I got my master's degree here at UC Irvine in about 12 months. Uh, 1996 to 1997. While I was getting my master's degree, I also started working at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which funded some of my PhD. I commuted up to 605 to the 210 for about six months out of those 12 months. So it's nice to come back to UC Irvine. I also want to thank the uh, CAVLI, FOS, uh, Frontiers of Science, uh, and Frontiers of Engineering, because it's through this, what's really important to all of us is the connections that we make and the people in our lives. I have to say that I have this position at the University of Michigan because of the connections I made at the Indonesian FOS in 2014 with Professor Don Siegel. He introduced me to the University of Michigan, and that's why I'm there. And, um, that's why, that's how I got to U of M. I'm really happy to be there. Okay, so let's get started. Um, before I begin, I have to acknowledge where the, a lot of my money, money comes from. It comes from you and me, from your tax dollars. So I have to thank the Department of Energy, in particular two arms of the Department of Energy. Uh, energy and Efficiency in Renewable Energy, that office, so it's more like applied research. And then also ARPA-E, which stands for Advanced Research Project Agency hyphen Energy, which really focuses on commercialization. So I have a startup company that's working on the advanced kind of these advanced batteries we'll talk about in the latter half of my presentation. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge where the funding comes from. So I'm going to dive right in. <laughs> I chart. But I'm going to guide you through this eye chart. I, everything starts with energy. So let me just start you on the left-hand side. I'm going to just tell you where to focus. Where does all this energy come from, right? And if you're interested in looking at all those little tributary, all little rivers and such, please visit this Lawrence Livermore um, website. This is for 2021. It's important to know, if we're talking about EVs, transitioning from fossil fuels to electric future, where all the energy, and particularly the United States, where it comes from, right? And if we look at petroleum, that basically powers transportation and uh, industry, right? So the next thing we want to look at is just how much of the energy we use goes to transportation. By the way, I'm not going to try to define these awful British units of quads, but the nice thing is 97.3 energy units of quads is close to 100. So if you look at all these numbers, they're basically close to percentages, right? So if you look at transportation, 26.9% of that energy that we use goes to transportation. This is kind of an aside thing, but I find this astonishing that, you know, we still rely here in the 21st century on heat engines. And heat engines are notoriously bad in terms of, or low, have low efficiency, right? So we waste twice as much energy that we use. Um, electrochemical technologies are much more efficient, especially the mine, which is what I'm gonna talk about today, up to 99% efficient. And then one other thing, as we think about transitioning off of fossil fuels to electric future, where's electricity to come from to power electric cars? We got to get going in this space. Solar's 1.5-ish percent and wind. These are tapped out. Nuclear, hydro, geothermal. We want to rely more on fossil fuels. So we really have to augment solar and wind. And we have to do so in terms of numbers. If we want to get off of fossil fuels, almost a tenfold increase in solar and wind. All right, so I'm going to give you some current perspectives. You know, I guess one of my jobs here, my responsibility is just to distill what I see out there in the community, high level industry, commercial sectors, and also in the scientific sectors. So this is what I see kind of as a culmination of, of what I see in those three sectors. So the current perspective is, despite the high gas prices over the last 10 or 15 years, there's definitely a commitment to get off of internal combustion engine technology and go to vehicle electrification or batteries, right? They're expecting, though this COVID and the uh, Ukrainian war has created a ripple, or a, there's a bit of a speed bump there, maybe pushes this cost parity out to 2025 or be, a little bit beyond, but that's expected, and this based on the cost of batteries, around 2025. And to put a number to that cost parity, the cost of the batteries in terms of dollars per energy, it's about $80 per kilowatt hour. 
that's where the bat that's the battery cost that's needed to reach cost parity with an internal combustion engine powered power uh, powertrain. So then we don't have to rely as taxpayers. This is nice. We don't have to the companies don't have to rely on government subsidies. It comes from our pockets basically. And then also in 2025, um, this is the true tipping point, right? Because now we've, we've reached that cost parity. It makes sense to buy an electric vehicle in terms of performance and cost. All right, transitioning now to the battery landscape or the industry landscape. Um, typically, and these numbers are reached based on the economy of scale. When a battery factor makes about battery factory makes about five to ten kilowatt, or sorry, gigawatt hours of energy storage per year. That's where they reach the economy of scale. So your typical battery factory has to make about five or 10 gigawatt hours of energy per year worth of battery storage. In 2020, worldwide, there's about 200 gigawatt hours of battery production facility. If you put that in the context of Tesla Model S's, that's about 2 million. Not that they made that many, but that would be the equivalent of 2 million Tesla Model S's with the 100 kilowatt hour battery pack, or 6 million Nissan Leafs. In 2030, that's, there's going to be a tenfold increase in battery production capacity, 2,000 gigawatt hours of global energy capacity. And of that 2,000 gigawatt hours, 1,500 goes to commercial and passenger vehicles, and the other 500 goes to electronics and such. And of course, this brings up this question, where will all these batteries come from? Where will all the raw materials come from? There's a lot of questions that have to be answered in the next few years. OK. so. More about timelines, where we are now and where we're going to really make this a solid transition from fossil fuels to electric future. So in 2020, it's about 3%. I know in California, this might not seem like the case. I was in California, Northern California last week. It's like every other car is a Tesla. But it's not like that in the rest of the United States, as I'm sure you all know. But 3% United States, or sorry, 3% worldwide uh, are the vehicles or EVs. There is this pandemic, obviously, that slowed things down, this transition due to uh, uh, supply chain issues and such, and just the, the uh, sales were down. But <clears throat> overall, by 2023, they're expected to double to 7%. And again, 2025 is the, the quasi-tipping point, because that's where we reach cost parity with internal combustion engines. And that's when we get to 10%. And by 2030, it's supposed to get to 30% EVs, and then this is where this other inflection point comes, because at 30 percent, where does the electricity come from? And this is where we have to augment the grid, obviously. That's another talk that I'm not going to talk about, but this is another significant issue. And then by 2040, I get really happy, especially if I'm still alive, then I hope, because we're at 58 percent-ish uh, of vehicle sales. Um, 500 million of the 1.6 billion vehicles on the road will be passenger and commercial EVs. I'm really happy if we can get to that point, because that, to me, says we're on our way for many future millennia to come to an electric future. But it's going to take a lot of work to get there, obviously. OK, so that's the motivation. This is what I've worked for, to be honest with you. This is a very important talk to me, because I feel like things are really coming together. I, I've, I had hoped throughout my two, year, two decades of a career that I could participate in this transition uh, from fossil fuels to electric future. And it's neat to see that, it, that it's happening. Not that I had anything to do with, but it's neat to be part of this, this transition. So now I move into the more technical part of my presentation. But before I do, just a little bit of jargon, not to insult anybody's intelligence here, but in case you don't work on batteries and watts and, and power and, and such, I just wanted to say, just give you a little bit of uh, jargon background so you can get a grasp of, like, the, to be more quantitative. Power is basically watts. If you press on the accelerator uh, pedal, this is how quickly you take the energy out of the battery pack and put it to the wheels. So that would be watts or current in amperes times volts. You multiply power times time, and you get energy. So watts times time is watt hours. If you want to think about the weight of the battery pack, now you divide that by the mass of the battery pack, you get specific energy, watt hours per kilogram battery. If you look at the size of the battery, it's watt hours, energy, divided by volume, watt hours per liter. So these are uh, metrics, numbers that we use to benchmark one technology or compare one co a battery technology to another. All right, so a little bit about you know, stepping back. How do we get here to lithium ion? How do we get to uh, electric vehicles that are battery powered instead of fuel cell powered? If one just steps back and looks at, at this black box, it looks like a battery, but let's just call it a black box for now, and say that in order for it to power a vehicle, as an internal combustion does, it has to have the following characteristics. 
between 23, 20 to 100 kilowatt hours, that's the capacity, has to be maybe less than 200 kilograms and less than 100 liters in volume. It has to provide about one to three or one to five kilowatts per kilogram of power. To reach cost parity, it has to be less than $5,000 with an internal combustion engine. It has to be very efficient. Every time we put a watt in, we have to get a watt out, more or less. So 99.999% efficient if it's going to last 10 years or about 1,000 uh, cycles. It has to operate between minus 40 and 50 degrees Celsius. So it can be, it's useful in other parts of the all across the country. It'd be nice if we can charge it as fast as in the same amount of time it takes to fill up a gas tank. And of course, the safer it is, the better. So we look at the technology that can go into that black box, that can provide that electricity. One can think of fuel cells, and this is happening. There are fuel cells out there, fuel cell powered vehicles. But if you think about, this is my opinion, with fuel cells, how you, store, how you get to create the hydrogen? What's the carbon footprint to do that? How you to store the hydrogen? Um, what are the kind of catalyst are you going to use to convert that hydrogen to electricity? There are still a lot of unknowns about fuel cells. So I put a big question mark there. There are also capacitors, uh, but they just do not have adequate specific energy, as do flywheels, which convert kinetic energy to electricity. Then there's batteries. Historically, there's been three types of batteries, lead acid that powered the EV1 in the 1990s. But this could only go maybe 50 to 70 miles on a charge, and it's relatively small. Nickel metal hydride has been the workhorse of the Prius, right? So that did a, it, nickel metal hydride proved the concept that these plug-in hybrid, or not plug-in hybrids, hybrid electric vehicles work quite well. But in order to get the performance that we expect today out of a vehicle, an electric vehicle in particular, it really should be a lithium battery, right? A lithium-based battery. And why is that? Not to go into too much detail, but why lithium in terms of the chemistry and it's just its behavior? Lithium up there in the top left of the periodic table, it's relatively small and has low mass. Therefore, it can diffuse. So I say diffuse is a very specific term related to how quickly a solid, an atom, can move in a solid. Because in a lithium ion battery, lithium is stored inside materials, inside host materials rather than on top, like in a lead acid battery. So it being small and mobile is very important. Another thing about its character, characteristics being up in the top left of the periodic table, it has very few electrons. It doesn't want, it wants to give away those electrons because it has so few. And that manifests in voltage. It really has a high propensity to get rid of its electron, and that gives, that re, gives rise to a relatively high voltage, four volts, uh, which is not common in aqueous, is not achievable in aqueous systems. On the right-hand side of the screen, is, I give credit to Sony because they invested in lithium-ion batteries. There's a whole techno-economic analysis as to why they did that, why they converted their, their magnetic tape technology into making batteries. I can talk about that later, but, or offline. But they give, they're given credit for inventing a lithium-ion battery. The Nobel Prize was awarded recently to two Americans, Professors Goodenough and Professor Whittingham, and also one Japanese uh, who from Sony. OK, so how does a lithium-ion battery work? Uh, and what's inside a lithium-ion battery? So in a lithium-ion battery, you have basically three components. You have this metal oxide cathode. And it consists of typically a layered material, where you have this metal oxygen, these metal oxygen layers and then lithium ions that go in between. And because it's a layered material, lithium ions can move relatively easily in, that plane, in the sideways, basically, in this orientation. Um, on the anode side, um, there's basically just one anode that works quite well right now. That's the graphite anode. And th for the same reason that when we write with a pencil, when we exfoliate graphene layers as we drag our pencil tip across a piece of paper, that kind of bonding that allows that easy exfoliation of graphene also makes it easier for lithium ions to go in between the graphene layers and graphite. And then the third component is an inactive component, meaning it does not store energy. And this is the electrolyte. So it's a liquid electrolyte that has a sole purpose of transporting lithium ions. And then along with that liquid electrolyte, there's this, it's like a piece of paper. It's porous, has interconnected porosity. It's made out of a polymer. Its job is to allow the passage of lithium ions through that porous material while preventing electrical short circuiting between the anode and cathode. I'll talk about each of these components in more detail in the next few slides. And then it's important to note that in an electrochemical cell, you want to maximize the voltage of the cathode, minimize the voltage close to zero as possible for the anode, because the difference between those two gives your cell voltage. And you want to maximize the cell voltage to maximize power and energy. All right, so during discharge, 
stepping on the accelerator pedal. pedal um, lithium ions are extracted, I'll do that again, <clears throat> from the graphite anode, transport through the liquid electrolyte, and then insert or intercalate between layers in the cathode. So everything that happens inside the cell only invi involves lithium ions. Everything that happens outside of the cell involves electrons, right? So this is what happens during discharge. Those electrons that go through an external circuit power a light bulb or your electric car. Um, these materials, again, are host materials. They uh, uptake and release lithium ions. Therefore, the more lithium they can uptake and release, the better they perform. And again, just to reiterate, inside the packaging of a cell, that's where lithium ions move. Outside the cell, outside the packaging, that's where electrons move during charge and discharge. Basically, the opposite reaction happens from discharged uh, and charge. OK, so let's look at the anatomy of a lithium ion cell. And this is a particular format called, uh, it's a cylindrical wound cell. Looks like a jelly roll if you look at the cross section. I'm going to go through each one of these components in a little bit more detail in a moment. But basically, you have, it's like a AA battery. You have the positive button on the top, positive lead. And the rest of the can is the negative lead. Uh, lithium ion batteries, if there's some kind of event where it releases gas, too much gas, and it pressurizes, there's a safety event. Um, and then basically, the, where the action is, we have these three layers. We have a positive electrode, cathode, the separator material, and then we have the anode, right? So I'm going to talk about those three layers in more detail uh, in a moment. OK, so what I showed you two slides ago, the atomistic perspective, it's really not, it's difficult to go from that perspective to the real perspective. Um, so I, I created these next couple of slides because there, what occurs at the atomic scale, it's important to know what happens physically, but it's difficult to grasp if you were to look at just, if you were to open up a cell and look at it. So that's why I created these two different length scales of analysis in decomposing uh, a lithium ion battery. So if one opens up a lithium ion cell, uh, you'll see that it consists of particles, particles that are on the order of maybe a few tens of microns. So the, the diameter of human hair is about 50 to 60 microns, so maybe a couple of, depending on who it is. Um, and uh, so that these particles consist of maybe, like, uh, maybe a few 5 to 10 microns, and there are many particles stuck together with a certain kind of binder, and they comprise the anode if it's graphite, and some lithium metal oxide if it's the cathode. And then in between, again, is this polymeric separator that's saturated with the liquid electrolyte. In other words, this light blue phase all permeates from left to right. So everything inside a lithium ion cell is, is wetted by the, the liquid electrolyte. OK, so if we look at, and this is maybe an older generation. This pie chart was made a little while ago. If you ask Elon Musk or others, the, the pie is sliced a little bit differently, and for good reasons. But if you look at the red and the blue, that's what stores your energy in this particular plot. That's the active anode, these particles, the, the graphite particles. And then the active cathode, these particles. Right? So what folks like Elon Musk and LG Chem and Samsung are trying to do is trying to make, make it such that these materials occupy more of the cell mass per unit mass. But there's a lot of inactive mass with lithium ion batteries, such as the uh, casing. Um, there's the separator material. Uh, for the anode, we can't get away from this copper. It's like 8 grams per cc. It's heavy. But for electrochemical reasons, we have to use copper foil. And it's, it's heavy. And so a lot of inactive mass comes from the copper. And then also the aluminum, has, the cathode has the aluminum current collector. And then you have to add carbon to the aluminum carbon to the cathode to make it more conductive. So this gives you an idea of the distribution between active and inactive. And the goal here is to maximize the active per unit mass or volume. So these are kind of like the engineering challenges that lithium ion manufacturers are, are work, currently working on. All right, so for the anode, if one were to deconstruct the anode and use a, a scanning electron microscope, we would see particles, again, that are about 10 microns top down. If you fracture the, fracture the uh, anode, one would see these fracture surfaces that looks like this, the particles. And then each of these particles have crystallographic domains, and that's where the graphite does its thing. It uptakes and releases lithium ions. Um, in terms of capacity, so if one were to take about 7 grams of lithium and convert that to electrical energy storage, that would be the equivalent. 7 grams gives you about 27 ampere hours of charge, because lithium has one charge, plus one, you get an electron for every lithium ion. And for every seven grams, you can get 26.8 ampere hours per gram of charge. Whereas with graphite, you have to have six carbon atoms for every lithium atom. 
and therefore there's a huge weight penalty. We're at 372 milliampere hours per gram. So a huge compromise going from pure lithium metal to graphite. But graphite works quite well. OK, and then one other thing is I thought I'd mention like the, the highlights of lithium ion. What is it that degrades the lithium ion battery when we charge and discharge it? It has to do with this rust-like layer called the solid electrolyte interface. It's, it's like an organic, inorganic layer. Every time a lithium ion battery is charged and discharged, as the lithium ions go in between these basal planes of graphite, they expand and contract. As they do, small, small fissures or cracks occur in the solid electrolyte interface, exposing new graphite, and then it has to reform this, this rust layer. Every time that rust layer has to reform, it irreversibly sequesters lithium, and that, that causes irreversible loss. And that's what causes deg degradation in, in capa or capacity fading lithium ion batteries. OK, so um, what happens at the atomic scale when we put lithium into an anode and take it out? So if we look at, if one were to do electrochemical measurements in a laboratory to see what the voltage of the anode is versus lithium metal, and correlate that to what's happening physically inside the graphite particles. One would see, so black atoms are carbon, the purple atoms are lithium. You look at the voltage versus how much lithium goes into and out of the graphite. And you can see that the lithium atoms, when it goes in between these layers at the higher voltages, there's just a few lithium atoms that are between the layers. But as we start to put more and more lithium, it goes in at certain steps. So stage four is every fourth layer up basal layer of graphene in the graphite is filled by, by graph, uh, lithium, right? So this would be stage four. Stage three, every three layers, lithium. Stage two, every two layers, until you get a fully saturated stage one. All of the graphite is intercalated with lithium, and that's where it's basically full, right? So that's what happens physically when we put lithium into our graphite anode. And then the, the, the opposite happens when we take lithium out, right? You get the destaging of lithium and graphite. OK, moving away from the anode and going to the cathode, there's a little more variety with the cathode. So if one were to look at uh, a cathode particle, it's sometimes referred to as meatballs. It looks like a meatball there. Uh, each one of these little grains of meat or, or in the meatball is a crystallographic domain uh, of this type of layered structure. And this is why Professor John Goodenough at the University of Texas, Austin, you know, I think he just turned 100, uh, maybe this, or he's going to this, this month. <clears throat> Quite a guy. This was his invention. He did the, like, the quantum mechanical calculations, the material science, to figure out that this material, lithium cobalt oxide, which is part of the Nobel Prize, uh, would, would be a great cathode for lithium ion batteries. Right? Um, it has a lot, right, the right layered structure, so lithium ions can move into and out of like left and right in the plane. And it had the right quantum mechanical and electrochemical properties to give it high voltage and high capacity. Um, so this is what the cathode looks like, basically. These crystallographic domains, and there are many grains in a meatball. Now, there are different flavors of cathode. And where I'm going with this is, with all these different flavors, what is the, what is the, the trade space? Or what, what are the options moving forward with cathodes? So that's where I'm going with this. And that's why I show this comparison. So if we look at performance metrics, how heavy is it, grams per cc, these different cathode types? What is the specific capacity? This is the uh, measure of how much lithium is taken up and released per gram of material, but doing that in terms of charge. What's the voltage? If it's a cathode, the higher the voltage, the better. And if you were to just make a cell with this, this, this cathode material, this is what the value would be in terms of watt, hour, watt hours per kilogram of just that cathode material. So the higher this is, the better. This was the Nobel formulation, lithium cobalt oxide. It's still used in some cells. Lithium nickel oxide. We all know, uh, well, many of us know that cobalt is prob problematic, the way it's mined. It's scarce, and also it's expensive. So the world does not have enough cobalt. The way it's mined is not sustainable or ethical. So we have to move away from cobalt. That's why we're looking at things like lithium nickel oxide. Lithium manganese oxide is starting to fall out of favor because it doesn't cycle well. This is turning out to be one of the winners in terms of getting rid of the cobalt, supplanting, replacing that with more nickel and manganese. And that gives some of the highest capacities of 170 to 230 uh, milliamp hours per gram. This is an outlier. Profe the, yes? I don't see salt on Salt? We're getting salt. I'm, I'm getting to salt okay. in terms of uh, ex like sustainability and where it's coming from and all that stuff? Or? Well, I just don't see it on your chart. It's, I have a couple slides on that. Uh, 
Professor Whittingham, one of the other, the other American that got the Nobel Prize, is a big proponent of this material because for every molecule of vanadium oxide, you can get two lithiums, and therefore it has a much higher capacity, but it suffers from low voltage, super high specific energy, but uh, it's not sustainable and it's somewhat, it's somewhat toxic. So again, <clears throat> this seems to be one of the winners. So this is where I come. I ask myself and I look across the industry, if what, how much better can lithium ion batteries get? If we take just graphite anodes, not my, nothing else can seem to supplant graphite. And we look at the cathode side, how much better can the cathode get? So if you look at the, this is the space that, we have, that we're working in for how good, a, to answer that question as to how good a cathode can be for a lithium ion battery. It has to contain lithium. When lithium ion batteries are made, the lithium is actually in the cathode. Probably should have oxygen. And then it has to consist of a transition metal, meaning it can go through multiple valence changes. And it has to be reasonably weight, uh, light and abundant. So that really means that we have to be in this region in the periodic table. Titanium doesn't have the right quantum mechanical properties. The voltage is too low. Vanadium is problematic for the reasons I just said. Chrome has toxicity issues, so it's really down to manganese, iron, cobalt, and nickel. They're all next to each other on the periodic table, have similar densities. So when we take these elements of similar densities, similar compositions, they all crystallize in more or less the same crystallographic orientation. Therefore, they all have the same weight. Basically, we're kind of stuck in a box. The th maximum theoretical capacity of a cathode of any kind of crystalline compound with those four elements, manganese, iron, cobalt, or nickel, is about 280 milliamp hours per gram. But if you, if you think about a parking garage, if you think about lithium as the pillars in a parking garage, if you take out too many pillars, that parking garage is going to fall. So you can't take out all that lithium. And so instead of reaching the theoretical value, you have to keep some lithium in there. The practical value is about 230 milliamp hours per gram. So I, if one asks me how much better can a cathode get, I think we're pretty much close to the, the maximum limit for the cathode performance. But there's one more thing. Um, or let me answer like how good the current state-of-the-art cathode can be. As I mentioned, lithium cobalt oxide is how that was the invention that led to the invention of lithium-ion battery. So cobalt surrounded by six oxygens, lithium. Cobalt's problematic for the reasons I said. If you put nickel in there, it's cheaper and can increase the capacity. But nickel has this propensity to migrate into the lithium channels, and it plugs up the lithium channels. So if one can put a little manganese in there and the right cobalt, one can prevent that nickel migration, and that can improve their performance. So I think I just said these things. So that's NMC. This is the cathode that we're all using these days. It was invented or optimized, I'd say, at Argonne National Laboratory, and now everybody around the world is using this, except for one other cathode that I'm going to talk about in a moment. All right, let me just go through this really quickly. Um, yeah, nickel is an issue because most of the nickel, a lot of the nickel, the foreign nickel is coming from Russia, but because of the Ukraine war, it's affecting nickel supply. Also, nickel uh, is used in stainless steels, so we have to compete with the stainless steel industry. If we want sustainable, a sustainable supply chain in the United States, there's a nickel mine in Michigan, uh, but they're going to close that in about 10 years. The next mine will be in uh, Minnesota. Um, again, we can add manganese. That's cheap and non-toxic. That helps. But you can only substitute so much manganese to get the desired performance. So basically, NMC started with atomic ratios of one nickel, one manganese, one cobalt, trying to get rid of cobalt. So they went to six nickel, three manganese, two cobalt. Now they're currently working on eight nickel, one manganese, one cobalt. But the problem is, sure, that's great. You're getting rid of the cobalt, but you're reducing the cobalt, but you're not getting rid of the cobalt, right? So that's the issue. And that's where I come to. There's an, another kind of cathode out there, and it's, it's getting a lot of traction these days. And that, too, was invented in America. All right, it's this one. It's an iron-based cathode. Plenty of iron, cheap, non-toxic, no supply chain issues. <clears throat> um, if we look at the standard cobalt, based or nickel manganese cobalt layered structures. Uh, they rely on cobalt or manganese and nickel. There's another problem. If you overcharge a nickel manganese cobalt NMC cathode, it releases oxygen. It generates heat. Not a good thing when you have a combustible liquid electrolyte. That's what causes fires. But if you go to this lithium iron phosphate, so instead of using oxygen, you use PO4 as the anion. This is a much more stable bond, and it's non-flammable. It never releases oxygen. But most importantly, it's iron-based. It's not cobalt. It does not rely on cobalt or nickel at all. 
Why are we there? It's because, why aren't we going exclusively to, to lithium iron phosphate? It's because the voltage is relatively low, right? Has good capacity, low density, but its, its overall specific energy is kind of low. But, you know, this is going to be a game of trade-offs, you know. What we can't, if we can't get access to nickel and cobalt, or there's just not enough, it's too expensive, then we have to think about alternatives. Okay, so the, really quickly, A123 Systems was a beneficiary of a lot of taxpayer money, and uh, they made lithium iron phosphate happen, but it's no longer in the United States. This question has to be asked, right? So about lithium, is there enough lithium to go around if you don't recycle, right? So the, um, I talked to Ted Miller, he works at Ford down the road. This is a typical salt mine in South America. They require a lot of fresh water. Um, if one uses four to six kilograms of lithium, again, that's stored in the cathode, there's enough for 10 to 11 fully electric vehicles. So if we only had to go around once, no recycling, there's that much, there's enough lithium uh, to make 10 to 11 fully electric vehicles. That's one perspective. Another perspective, uh, a paper written by an academic, looks at the lithium on land versus the lithium in, in the sea. And his projection in his paper is that by 2080, if we go by our current consumption of lithium to make primarily EVs, that we're going to run out to basically about a third of the lithium on land, right? So um, right now there's 14 million tons of lithium on land. This is kind of old, actually, because back then, South America was producing the most lithium. If you look at the, the news today, it's Australia's producing the most lithium these days. But, you know, just like there's OPEC, there's going to be like a LIEC or something, like a lithium exporting countries agreement. There must be, because it's becoming so valuable. But if everybody wants access to lithium, you know, there's plenty of lithium in the ocean. Um, oh, sorry, I made that point already. The problem with the lithium in the ocean, it's less than 0.1 parts per million. So we have to think about technologies on how to uh, concentrate that lithium and take it from the ocean. And let's hope that there are no uh, ecological consequences of taking lithium out of the seawater as well. So those are some perspectives on how much lithium there is if we're going to go to an all-electric future using lithium-based batteries for EVs. Okay, um, i got to come back to the last component. It's kind of a boring one, to be honest with you. It's the separator. So we talked about the anode, graphite, cathode, NMC, and lithium iron phosphate. Let's talk about the separator. Um, it was in the news recently. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. This is this polymer layer, about, you know, about 25 microns thick. It's like paper. It's porous. And filled in those pores, the separator is a liquid electrolyte. It consists of a non-aqueous, can't have any water. Lithium batteries hate water. Um, and um, carbonate solvents. And it uses lithium. And one of the reasons why water is really bad for batteries is because of the fluorine. Uh, anybody who works in a lab, you heard of hydrofluoric acid, we watch Breaking Bad and how they dissolve the, bo the bodies, they use hydrofluoric acid. It's nasty stuff. If there's water around, you form HF when you have a PF6 uh, anion. But in the news, this was what they, what Samsung uh, did is they pushed the limits. They tried to make this separator as thin as possible to maximize the amount of, because it just occupies dead space. But it, when it got thin, they had short circuits, right? And that's what caused these fires. I, my understanding is that was about a $7 billion debacle, right? So they had to backtrack all that money, or they had to backtrack and pay that much because they, they pushed the limits with regard to that separator. OK, uh, lithium ion cell types, kind of boring stuff, but this is the 18650. This is the most common one, 18 millimeters, 65 millimeters long. Uh, I guess they added zero just so it rolls off the tongue a little bit better. Don't know why the zero's there. Prismatic cells, Toyota likes. The, so this is like a pouch cell but it's a rigid can, so it's a rigid, uh, like a metal canister. This is the most common you've probably seen for anything that's not a Tesla. It's a pouch cell, so the pouch material is like coffee bag material. It's a trilaminate polymer, aluminum polymer, and then these are not relevant to EVs, but we know, all know about watch batteries. Okay, so just really quickly, this is something that I've, I'm very privileged to work over, so my laboratory is directly over the University of Michigan Battery Lab. But at U of M, we have this uh, pilot line facility where we can make these batteries. And just really quickly, how are they made? I'll show you in four squares. You make a paint with an anode or a cathode. You mix it with a certain solvent, a certain binder. It's like a Teflon derivative. You take that paint and you coat it on the appropriate foil. In this case, it's graphite particles on an anode. 
It's like Quiznos, you're drying off the solvent as it goes, and it's taken up on a spool. They're at meters per minute, and maybe like a meter wide in these factories. Um, and then once you have that electrode, you punch it. If it's a pouch cell, you punch out squares. Once you have those squares, anode, square, cathode, square, or rectangles, separator, <clears throat> then you can use robots. There are very few people. I mean, these things are automated, these, these uh, manufacturing facilities. This is a Z stacker. It's stacking all the cathodes. It folds in the separator, welds the tabs, and that's basically the lithium ion cell. Put it into a pouch, fill it with liquid electrolyte, and seal it up. And that's essentially how batteries are made. Okay, so I just have to talk about some environmental impacts, right? So that liquid that comes off of the uh, is uh, is caustic and methylpyridone NMP. So they're working on ways to go to dry processing. I think when I was here four years ago, um, Tesla bought Maxwell. I think that's in close to San Diego. They have a they have a way of making electrodes, capacitor electrodes with a dry process, so no polymers, no no solvent. So that's something to look forward to in the future, a more sustainable, environmentally friendly manufacturing. Okay, you know, in the interest of time, I think I'm going to move over this stuff, because pass over this, because I think you're all familiar with uh, the trade-offs with cost, performance, um, and battery pack size with the Tesla. So cost parity. So this is 2015. This is a really um, um, a seminal paper. It really talked about the, the projections in terms of cost. <clears throat> you take these aggregate, aggregated values for, like, Tesla and Nissan. Boy, it's just a mess. But... You can see where they're trending. I mean, $150 per kilowatt hour, but it's got to be down to eight, close to 80, but it's getting down there. I think another way of looking at this is like, what's the cost of the battery in terms of making the cost of the vehicle affordable to the... So maybe it's not really about dollars per kilowatt hour, it's just market penetration. So that's another way of looking at this plot. But they're getting close in terms of the dollars per kilowatt hour. Uh, it's a good reference. Where the, will these batteries be made? Who's the, who are the key players? A lot of information here. Let me just call out three names that you should, if you're in, um, interested in the companies that are making batteries. It's LG Chem, it's Samsung, it's SKI, two Korean companies. CATL, if I didn't mention that, that's the Chinese company. And then Panasonic and Tesla. Those are the key players in terms of battery manufacturing uh, across the world. Now, this will be posted, so if you're interested, these are some really good, um, I know these authors of all these papers. Uh, I've, I've had them. All right, so just to summarize the first part of my talk, first two-thirds of my talk, um, lithium-ion batteries consist of three components. You have an anode. The more negative the voltage is, the better. Cathode, the more uh, positive the voltage is, the better. And then the uh, separator, an electrolyte. Uh, lithium, when charging, discharging a lithium-ion battery, lithium-ion batteries come out of an at one host material and intercalate into the other and they're transported through the liquid electrolyte. The opposite uh, occurs during charge and discharge. Um, it, that, co that, the, that plot that I showed a moment ago is kind of difficult to, to really extrapolate what the cost is going, but from what we're hearing, this $80 per kilowatt hour, especially with the economy of scale that they're reaching and the supply chains in China, is a, is a real possibility, especially if you go to lithium iron phosphate. And this is where we get to the EV cost parity with the internal combustion engines at $80 per kilowatt hour. You know, the cathode is an issue. Where is this cobalt coming from? Can we really get rid of all the cobalt? Next is nickel. Can we, what can we do about nickel? Do we really have to go to an iron-based cathode? These are big questions that will have to be answered, not in seven years, but probably the next few years, as the percentage of electric vehicles hit the road. Uh, obviously, there's significant uh, opportunities for growth, and I think it's, I'm happy to say that this is a, a battery moment in history. Okay, so just in the few slides here, I want to talk about advanced battery technologies. <laughs> what, what's coming down the pipe? Is lithium ion the final frontier? And uh, I think the answer is no. For three reasons. We still need to get the batteries need to be better, safer, and cheaper. So if we look at a better battery, what if we can make a battery that can get us to 500 miles per charge, right? So that's as much, about as much as we can tolerate on the road if we go for a road trip, 500 miles. Or what if we had a battery pack that was more powerful, therefore it could be smaller, and there's less dead weight and dead volume to, 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 uh, to carry around as we drive our cars. And then something I didn't talk about when I said transportation in my, my presentation, I didn't talk about electrified flight. 
But when you talk about short haul, where there's a lot of miles traveled in the air, short haul, which is 600 miles or less, if you can get to this 350 watt hours per kilogram, then that becomes very interesting for electrified flight. So that's why I think there's still opportunities for better batteries that can enable new sectors in terms of electrification of transportation. And those numbers are moving out of this box where we have watt hours per liter and watt hours per kilogram, the max out about 250 and 400, and get to doubling of energy density and maybe 30% more in terms of specific energy. Safer, again, the liquid electrolyte is what's flammable, right? So if we can get rid of that liquid electrolyte, the fuel in these fires, we can make them infinitely safer. And then the cost, right? What can we do about the manufacturing in the raw materials? It really comes down to the raw material cost when it comes to batteries, because they're made so quickly and so efficiently. Really what drives the cost of a battery is the raw material costs. So can, how do we get down to 100 or less than $80 per kilowatt hour? And if you ask me this question about what's beyond lithium ion, 10 years ago, there were several competitors. And they're, they're on the screen right now, three, I'd say. So here's our, here's our standard lithium ion battery. This type of battery was a lithium oxygen battery. Lithium metal was the anode. Oxygen was the cathode. And then there's a non-aqueous type. Then there's a lithium oxygen battery that was an aqueous type. I'll talk about this in a moment. And then lithium sulfur. Sulfur is literally dirt cheap. And uh, it has a really good performance. So these are the three variants that really comprised beyond lithium ion batteries about 10 years ago. So something about what's appealing about these, these technologies. Again, if you look at cell voltage, this is the most important one. Theoretical specific energy, here's lithium ion. Lithium sulfur, wow, it's a huge jump in water per kilogram when you're reacting lithium with sulfur. Lithium oxygen, non-aqueous, again, order magnitude increase in ener specific energy. And similarly for lithium oxygen aqueous. So what really limits these technologies, uh, they kind of came to a head, like I said, about 10 years ago. Um, each one had its own is uh, issue. That rust layer that I described for the um, graphite anodes, it's even more severe with lithium sulfur. These polysulfide molecules would migrate over to lithium electrode and passivate it. So the cycle life of lithium sulfur battery is not so good. Lithium oxygen non-aqueous, that means you cannot have any ambient air, can't have any CO2, no nitrogen. It's just you have to have a closed system, basically. The vehicle has to take along, it has to carry its own pure oxygen or have an onboard oxygen purification system. And that's just not practical. And then for lithium um, oxide aqueous, <clears throat> this has a liquid electrolyte. Lithium hydroxide precipitates, or the solubility of lithium hydroxide in the liquid electrolytes is rather limited, and that limits the capacity. Uh, and also, those precipitates of lithium hydroxide solid would foul the cathode. So those are the practical limitations to those beyond lithium ion technologies. But one thing that they did have in common, instead of graphite, which lithium ion uses, six carbon atoms for every lithium atom, the holy grail anode is what all these three, elect these three electrochemical systems uh, relied on, use lithium metal, pure metallic lithium. And if you look at the capacity, again, in charge, milliamp hours per gram of lithium, that's a, there's a tenfold increase. Or, a factor, of 10, a factor of 10 penalty when you have to add six carbon atoms for every lithium atom, when you go from lithium metal, the holy grail, to graphite. So um, at U of M, we had uh, Nova come. And we did a short video here. Hold on a second, going too fast here. So before the lithium ion battery was invented, 1980s in Japan, <clears throat> they were very interested in cell phones and portable electronics. And the first generation of lithium batteries actually used lithium metal, the holy grail electrode. When they were discharged, but then they caught fire, as you'll see in a moment. So if you look at a lithium metal battery with a liquid electrolyte, so that's taking out the graphite electrode, putting in a lithium metal electrode, liquid electrolyte, lithium ion swimming around, the red electrode is the cathode. <clears throat> and so when you go to discharge a lithium metal battery, Lithium ions are stripped from the lithium electrode. Electrons go through an external circuit to power a cell phone. And then inside the cell, lithium ions start to fill in to that parking structure type uh, architecture that I was mentioning. No problem. Discharge was no problem at all. 
filling up the parking structure, discharge all the way, get all that energy out of that pure lithium electrode. The problem comes on the reverse cycle. So when one goes to charge a lithium battery, and this is where the fires occurred, what happens on lithium, the holy grail electrode on the surface, in the presence of a liquid electrolyte, is these tree-like structures called dendrites, they form on the surface. Right? And it's just something about the atomic nature of lithium, they always want to draw to form these tree-like structures. And with repeated cycling, what happens is those trees grow taller and taller. And eventually, what happens, this is pure lithium metal. It's a very good electrical conductor. It has a very low melting temperature. And I know how to find trouble. This is what happens. And this is what happened. And this is the motivation. This was the impetus to go from lithium metal batteries with liquid electrolytes to the lithium ion battery. Get rid of plating lithium on lithium and put lithium in graphite. And that was the big invention by Sony. OK, so what if we can go back to lithium metal? And how do we do that? It's just a brute force technique. There's a lot of elegance in terms of the materials discovery, but physically, it's just that. Don't let those tree-like tree structures form in the first place by physically squashing them with a solid electrolyte. So if you take a current lithium-ion battery, this is drawn to scale. Let's get rid of graphite because of the volume that it contributes, volume and mass, to the lithium-ion cell. Let's go back to lithium metal. This is, again, drawn to scale. Dramatic reduction in the volume of the lithium-ion cell. And how do we do this? Again, we put in a solid electrolyte like a ceramic, super hard, much harder than lithium metal. Those tree-like structures when lithium deposits cannot form because they're being pushed and physically squashed on the solid electrolyte. So at the cell level, if one can do this, making this type of material, you can see the dramatic improvement in terms of energy density. You can reduce the volume of the cell. Another thing, though, is that you can get rid of the liquid. Right? There's no liquid in the cell. It's not combustible. And because of these materials, these ceramics, uh, their performance gets, the transport of lithium ions gets exponentially better with increasing temperature. You want it to get hot, right? So you can do away with a lot of, and this adds a lot of mass, complexity, cost, and volume, the thermal management systems on EV, on EV battery packs. So if one can do away with the thermal management, you can have dramatic improvements at the, cell, the pack level as well. So a lot of impetus, two, two good reasons to go from a liquid to a solid electrolyte. So this was 2018. But billions of dollars are getting poured into solid state batteries. And this is where I wanted to say, <clears throat> 2012, the lay of the land in terms of beyond lithium, there are three, three competitors. So I've been in this business for 25 years. Never have I seen convergence into one technology. So I've seen over the last 10 years or so, all that beyond lithium seems to be focused on solid state batteries. And that manifests in also significant investments. There are several companies, startup companies, Quantumscape and Solid Power. They have, they're spa they spacked in their, uh, billions of dollars of cash. And the big the OEMs, they're investing a lot of money into this technology. Not to say that it works, because not a single icon on that slide has successfully in industrialized solid state batteries. But there's a lot of investment going into it. OK, so just really quickly, um, what are the properties? It has to conduct lithium ions as fast as a liquid can at room temperature. And some do. And actually, some of the sulfide materials, ceramic materials, conduct lithium ions faster than a liquid at room temperature have to be stable against lithium metal if they're going to enable lithium metal batteries, have to have low interface resistance between the lithium metal and the solid electrolyte. They have to have adequate stiffness. So they can squash those dendrites. And ideally, they're processable in air so that they, their uh, energy intensity is it's not that energy intense. The energy intensity of production is not so high. Um, what are these materials? These are typically crystalline ceramic materials. They conduct one ion. That's a lithium ion. They cannot conduct. Uh, electrons, because then there'd be a short circuit. Uh, like I said, the ionic, the transport of ions has increases typically exponentially with temperature. That's the nature of the transport mechanism. Most of that volume is occupied by lithium ions. There's ceramics, there's some polymers, but there are very few ceramics out there that conduct ions as fast as the liquid does at room temp and that are stable against metallic lithium. All right. Um, Something else that's happened, I'm, not, I'm just going to call your attention to two classes. This is an eye chart, I know. But over the last 20 years, uh, there have been some material breakthroughs, that being the ceramic electrolytes that can conduct ions as, uh, in the solid state as fast as liquid can and are stable against lithium, and that's the oxides and the sulfides. 
So one example I want to leave you with, Samsung, huge team. I have to credit this person, Yuichi Aihara. I think he's done most of the work here. They are making a solid state battery that performs quite closely to a, a lithium ion battery, I'll say. And it uses the holy grail electrode, lithium metal. These are pouch cells. If you take a standard uh, lithium ion battery, drawn to scale, this is their battery. This is a cross section of their solid state battery. It's a sulfide based material. Sulfur is cheap. Lithium, sulfur, and phosphorus and chlorine, that's what it consists of. They have an NMC cathode, so it's a composite. The dark phase is the cathode. The light phase is the uh, sulfide electrolyte. Here's a solid electrolyte, the sulfide. And they have this magic silver carbon. Silver is not economically viable, but it works well. That's something they're working on. But this is what their, um, their, their breakthrough is. And this is defining state of the art in terms of solid state batteries, I'll say. If you charge one of their solid state batteries in five hours, this is what the discharge curve looks like. In three hours, one hour, you start to see some polarization at one hour. Basically, if you look at the utilization based on how quickly one cycles a battery, which would probably be around three milliamps per centimeter squared, that's state of the art, it's reaching performance parity with lithium ion. Same thing with the performance at temperature. <clears throat> It seems to drop off at lower temperatures, but so does lithium ion. I'd say similar behavior. This is the big one. You talk about cycle life. You know, they're getting to 1,000 cycles, you know, 80% uh, capacity retention with a solid state battery. This is really impressive stuff. Uh, I think this, like I said, uh, I think it's defining state of the art solid state batteries today. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to wrap things up here and skip over this part. I have some fundamental research stuff that I want to talk about, but I think this is. Uh, I'd rather just go to the, like the, the take home message for solid state. Let's say this, like what's the outlook? <clears throat> some questions, some pluses and minuses on this slide. If they're ceramics, ceramics are expensive because they're very, their performance is very sensitive to defects. So manufacturing is expensive. Performance, low temperature operation is somewhat of an issue because if you're using lithium metal, it doesn't flow so well uh, at lo lower temperatures. Pressure is a big one. With these solid state batteries, there's no liquid interface that can follow the solids as they, as they grow and contract. So one has to apply. In literature, what we see is a lot of pressure between 150 to 1500 PSI. 1500 PSI, you know, if you go to the, get a soda, the CO2 tanks, those are over 1000 PSI. That's a lot of pressure. Uh, this is the most important uh, line on this slide. It's the performance. This is what solid state batteries can offer, a doubling of energy density compared to lithium ion. Safety, that's the second biggest one. If we can get rid of combustible uh, components in a battery, it's infinitely safer. Uh, that, I didn't mention it, but these batteries are made with two components, cathode, electrolyte, and the lithium is plated from the lithium from the cathode. So you eliminate the need for graphite anodes. So that reduces cost. Uh, negatives, performance, uh, the charge discharge rates are still lower than lithium ion, but it's still not a, a, it's the same amount of Time and investment has not gone into solid state batteries as it's gone to lithium ions, so give it a chance, I say. Uh, safety, one downside, you know, like the skeleton in the closet for the sulfides, they're very sensitive to moisture, so they form H2S gas and that's toxic stuff. So if they're in a crash, there's water around, that is an issue. And again, just to reiterate the very first point, cost, these ceramics are, tend to be rather expensive. It's kind of an unknown because Nobody's really made these at scale yet, so we don't know how, how expensive they're going to be or how cheap they're going to be. OK, let me last my last slide here. I know I'm really taking a lot of time here, but <clears throat> just to summarize the latter half of my talk, the lithium chemistry is really unique to EVs because of its size and voltage. It does stuff that sodium and other elements cannot do. There were other, 10 years ago, beyond lithium ion technologies based on sulfur, oxygen, and ambient air, but due to like practical considerations, they just did not move forward. Like I said, I've never seen in 25 years convergence into one beyond lithium ion technology, but solid state seems to be garnering a lot of attention these days in the form of billions of dollars. <clears throat> um, it's not going to happen overnight, though, lith solid state batteries. You know, lithium ion, as internal combustion, they both will exist, coexist for many years, probably beyond 2030 to 2040. Um, lithium ion technology also is, is a very good technology. In supplanting it, it's not going to happen overnight. And I got to say, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. I was born and raised in Silicon Valley, you know, in the 1950s when NASA was thinking about making integrated circuits, planting individual atoms in other crystalline atoms to make the integrated circuit and to see how cheap and how, 
how well slow integrated circuits work today. You know, I use that as a good example. You know, solid state batteries, on paper, they work. They're, they're, they're checking a lot of boxes. I don't want to give up just yet. I know there are going to be some challenges, some bumps on the way, but uh, I'm really optimistic about the future for solid state batteries. With that, I want to stop, and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you for your attention.